last spray from volcano and open my eyes to see a fresh stream of snow white dust with a pale azure tint spewing out. I looked down at myself and saw that I would, had been half covered by the shimmering flakes while I was sleeping. I made a sluggish attempt to shake them off. I desperately wanted to go back to sleep the sky was beginning to light. I thoroughly disapproved of these early morning eruptions. I lay still for a little while longer, utterly failing to fall asleep, and eventually decided to check on the swine. Peering into the crater one last time, I saw a vicious lilac magma with thick orange veins scurgling and bubbling right up to the edge. Clearly about to erupt again and scatter billions of tiny dust particles. So I threw my bag over my shoulder in haste and began my slow descent. Once I was about halfway down, I realized I was going the wrong way. This side was steeper, and I had already had the dubious pleasure of sliding down on my backside at least twice. I stopped for a moment and looked around during a brief pause between eruptions. From that height, at least eight times taller than me, the view was extraordinary even by my exact standards. A thin, pearly strip slashed across the distant horizon, marking the beginning of a new day. Wet, heavy slate clouds as occur only in the early chars of the worthless lands, floated just a few centimeters above the ground, watering the nocturnal plants that had been waiting patiently all night. This would last a little while, and then the clouds would melt away as if they had never existed having succumbed to the scorching rays of Elon and Ather. The area spanning below was made of boundless, translucent, crystalline fields where a constant fine dust fell slightly like snow, covering Stazar with a shimmering carpet. Beautiful, I must say. Some travelers claim that the dust contains particles of rainbow dust and that there are methods of obtaining the purest strain. For words simple, I imagine the worthless lands would soon change their names to the value lands and be swarming with miners and others seeking peace and wealth. I had on occasion indulged in a walk here, enjoying the peace and solitude, but no great inspiration ever came to me in this lifeless place. As I mentioned with you before, these parts are only notionally uninhabited. After humans left Stazar, Several species of lesser people bred with the native states are flora and fauna, the Mutir, another sort of human relic. Mies are one of such examples. Personally, I always found them rather amusing. They grew twice as large as their historical ancestors, began standing on their hind legs, and learned to speak like all their lesser peoples. There have been occasions when, hoping for some solitude to muse a new story, I have unwittingly become an object of ridicule for a whole swarm of mice. They would line up behind me, mimicking my walking and copying my mannerisms for a good while before I noticed, or before a particularly impatient little mouse would advance and continue his pompous march ahead of me. They considered this to be a particularly impressive move, and given my disagreeable nature, only the most daring mice would chance it. After that, of course, I would scatter the swarm and they would scurry into their holes with squeaks of amusement. And if I were able to catch one of these little troublemakers, I would sit it on my shoulder and force it to tell me mouse stories of Stazar folklore. After which I would always give it a morsel of onion cheese. Frankly, I always thought that the mice were rather fond of me, and it was only because of their exuberant nature that they made fun of me. So I was in no way surprised to see a large mouse long whiskers sneaking along behind me. He looked somewhat conspiratorial, which was rather amusing, but he brought his finger to his little pink mouth. The universal stays are a sign for silence, and twitched his long whiskers in such a way to show that he was not in the mood for jokes. With a desperate wink, but still completely silent, which I must confess intrigued me even more. He beckoned me with a long claw. What do I do? Curiosity is the central characteristics of a good writer. So I'm proud to say I followed him. We walked for nearly 10 minutes. All sounds faded, leaving only cottony silence and a particularly white shimmering dust hung in the air. 
covering me from head to toe with a mysterious flicker. And I paused for a moment to admire the never-ending expanse. The mouse must have heard me stop as he looked around and impatiently waved a mousy paw, still in silence. So I had no choice but to continue following him at a rapid pace. As soon as he was convinced that I was still with him, he sank down to all fours and sped up to a mousy lope. I had never seen Mies running on all fours before, but this seemed fairly insignificant. I had plenty on my mind as it was. I contemplated my most recent story, which I could not get out of my head. And then my thinking, as often happens, turned to humans. Who were they, and why did they come here? What happened to them, and might they ever come again? Then I remembered that the reason I was on this journey is because I was chosen. I found this both amusing and pathetic. Amusing that I had gone along with such a flimsy pretext to leave the house. Pathetic that I was still wanting to believe it was true. About five minutes of rapid strides and multi-directional thoughts later, I spied a small object about half a mile away. The mouse and I accelerated our pace as if on cue, and I finally saw why I had been summoned. It was a tiny little mouse. She could not have been more than a couple weeks old. Her little body was the pale pink color found only in newborn mice. Her thin little legs were splayed at a strange angle, and her head lay lifeless on the ground. I went closer to try to figure out what might have happened to her, supposing the mouse was expecting me to help in some way. I touched her gently to shake the white dust from her tiny body. It appeared she had been attacked during our walk. Then I withdrew my hand at once, suddenly realizing that they must have been playing a trick on me. I looked around with a stupid smile, expecting to see a bunch of whiskered me's killing themselves laughing at behind me. But instead something bit me, sharp and quick, and suddenly weakness fell upon me like a heavy fog. The last thing I saw as I fell clumsily on my side was the silent white dust covering the worthless lands and a never-ending shroud.